All right. So welcome to the Extreme Tech Challenge Bootcamp. We're thrilled to kick off today's bootcamp with Fergus Hay, the founder and CEO of Elysian Fields, a global marketing and investment advisory firm specializing in venture-backed tech sector. Fergus had the privilege of living and working in North America, Asia, and Europe, collaborating with companies such as Uber, Lakestar, Builder AI, and Coca-Cola. After a successful career in advertising, Fergus left the corporate world to make a positive impact with health tech innovations. He holds advisory roles for leading digital health VC funds and tech startups, and sits on the fundraising advisory board of the biggest funder of the British Heart Foundation. Fergus is also a regular commentator on global tech news for BBC World News, Sky News, and NBC Euro News. He has also served as a judge and jury committee chairperson for several of our XTC startup challenges. We are thrilled that he's coming back with us today as another bootcamp speaker for this year. So Fergus, please take it away. Wow, Nancy, that uh, is humbling. Thank you so much. Uh, I should uh, I should have recorded that for myself. Uh, what a pleasure to be back here. So um, Nancy, John, Victoria, um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. We love the XTC uh, camp and group. Um, we think it's amazing founders, exciting agendas, changing the world with brilliant ideas. So anything we can do to help support um, those ideas to become reality um, is, is a pure privilege and a pleasure. What we want to do today is spend um, kind of 40 minutes talking through about how we can help create unfair advantages for um, founders. So as founders go on their, on their journey of creating products, raising capital, finding customers, and getting growth, um, the odds are normally stacked against you. And our job is to try to find some unfair advantages to help you pursue your growth and achieve your growth so you continue to raise money and build those un unicorn businesses that will positively impact the world. And we call it unfair advantages because um, if you go back into Greek mythology, you will know that the greatest battles of all time were fought, were won by unfair advantages. And in the Battle of Thermopylae, the Spartans, of which there were a thousand of them, were up against a Greek army of 80,000, and they were undoubtedly going to lose. So what they did is they created an unfair advantage. They found a very narrow canyon, which could only fit 10 people abreast, and they fought the Greeks in that narrow canyon, which meant they only ever fought 10 people at a time. That enabled them to hold their ground for three days, um, get all the, uh, the civilians away safely, and then defeat the Greeks um, through using the canyon and the unfair advantage. So we want you to be Leonidas, the king of Sparta. We want to help you find your unfair advantage so that you can also uh, conquer your market and bring your business to, to the wider world. And we've helped businesses create unfair advantages in their pursuit of growth um, over a considerable amount of time. We're, we're fortunate in that um, co-founder Martin and myself spent kind of combined 40 years um, running global marketing and advertising agencies. Uh, Martin was the founder of Blue, which was one of the UK's leading digital marketing agency that he exited to Dentsu, one of the biggest global marketing groups, and who was the chief strategy officer at Dentsu, developing all of their products and methods. I had the uh, privilege of working for WPP and Ogilvy globally, um, running their global P&Ls for big brands, but also um, being the CEO of an, an agency based out of London. I guess the other side that, that we find it to be quite useful is that um, we have roles with three venture capitalist funds, Blue Horizon, the world's leading alternate protein in, um, VC fund, Rise, which is a digital health fund, and Blue Lion Global, which is an early stage um, fund out of London. We sit on the advisory board and or the investment committees of these funds. And because of that, we see the metrics that investors evaluate startups through. And about half of those metrics are customer and marketing and sales metrics. And because of that, we've developed a method to enable startup founders to build their marketing growth plans to meet the metrics that the investors evaluate your business through. And that is the unfair advantage method, which you see on this screen with four critical steps of understanding how you're viewed by buyers, who your buyers are, what the value propositions are, and what your messages are. The third step is your differentiation, your brand story, why would you be noticed? And then the fourth one is, how do you go to market with a de-risked uh, marketing program that has A-B tested messaging so you can drive your cost per acquisition down and your revenue long-term value up? So we're going to walk you through the unfair advantage method. We're going to give you an introduction to the method so that you can look at your own business and consider what, um, what are the elements that would be relevant for you. 
So our customers uh, on the left, you'll see um, a whole bunch of startups ranging from pre from seed stage up to um, Series D. Uh, lots of B two B, some B two C, and uh, and also ethical businesses. So fintech, uh, software on demand, um, etc. Our investment partner network is uh, growing every day. I'm delighted to see Alex Bergo from Innovation Norway here. We've uh, been hatching plans of, of doing programs together um, and various funds um, based in the US and, and based in Europe. And we also have big corporate experience from our agency days, having worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. So that combination um, hopefully brings some credibility and insight to your journey that you're on. So let's start with what is marketing? We see it very simply as persuading more customers to be willing to pay a premium for your product and to repeatedly do so over time. Often people think of marketing as tactics and white papers and some um, paid media, but it's really a strategic discipline at the heart of the company to ensure that you are attracting customers and that you can build their value over time. And that's what the unfair advantage method focuses on. And there are three ways that um, getting your marketing in order now will help you. The first thing is the obvious one. It'll help you with sales. You'll get inbound sales and media interest. The second one, which is often overlooked, is that really good marketing will give you a continuous information loop on how your customers engage and interact with your product and your category. This provides key information to inform your product development cycle. So in the same ways that you have information flywheels for your product development, the marketing is also an added set of data and insight. And then thirdly, we always think of working back from your fundraising target. Um, ultimately, six months before you want to start fundraising, you need to be hitting KPIs and milestones that excite the very best investors. So understanding what those investors are looking for and developing a marketing plan that works backwards from those will enable you to raise capital from the best investors at good premium prices. And that's why we built the unfair advantage method. And we know that marketing is really, really important to investors. So Manu is a good friend, um, founder of Blue Lion. He said when he invested in Revolut because their, their CAC was sub $1 versus the $20 plus that their competitors such as Monzo, N26 and Chime were achieving. The point here is that marketing isn't um, a, a spend. Marketing is actually a critical part of your investment case. And if you can show that you've got incredible product market fit, message market fit and network effects, then your product may have competitors but your marketing will be a differentiator for you. And if you can show that your customer acquisition cost is lower than your competitors, you're going to be a much more attractive investment proposition. So marketing is a critical, critical part of the um, evaluation criteria for investors. So when we speak to founders, we hear some common challenges. And you may see these uh, some of your own challenges on this list. There will be more, of course. But these are the ones that we find to, uh, to be the most common. The first one is um, that we're better than our competitors but our buyers stick to incumbents. That's in that we've got great product, but the incumbents keep, keep the businesses. The second thing we hear is how do we stand out from the competition? It's a noisy market. We don't have the resources to stand out that our competition does. The third one we hear is how do we be more efficient in the marketing that we do? We have limited resources. We have a, a, a runway that is burning every month. And we need to make sure we use our money really efficiently. And then the fourth one is, I've just raised capital. How do I deliver on my promise of growth? And we've got a hockey stick chart, but now we've actually got to deliver it and the pressure is on because when we raise money, you also raise expectation. And regardless of the business challenge, it all starts and ends with the customer, your knowledge of the customer, how much you have validated that with primary research and how much you have really understood the problems that you're solving and the gains that you're creating for them. And actually, if you look at this um, evaluation criteria from NFX, which is the um, San Francisco-based um, venture capitalist fund, um, you will see that um, in highlighted in red, about half of the evaluation criteria are customer or market related. So that's relevant to the LTV, the CAC, the network effects, is the acquisition scalable, do you have good unit economics? This is an example of the list that um, investment committees evaluate um, businesses through. So what we try to do is build strategies that deliver against these metrics. Now for early stage companies, that's normally about building something that customers want and how to attract them. For later stage companies, kind of series B onwards, it's about how do you scale profitably your go-to-market plan. But both of these need deep, deep um, understanding of your customer, which is not based on your assumption, but based on primary research. And this leads us into the four steps of the unfair advantage model. The first step is look at your own business 
um, through a credibility prism, understand how credible you are in the eyes of your, of your customers and in the eyes of your investors. They're kind of one and the same. The second thing is really understand the insight that you're addressing in your customers. Do you really understand the problems you're solving? Have you validated that? And have you validated the uh, gains or benefits that you're creating? This is your value proposition work, which is so often overlooked. The third element is, are you differentiated in the market so that you're noticeable? And then the fourth element is, how do you spend your investors' money in the most efficient way to drive customer acquisition and scale so that you can hit your next fundraising milestones? These are the four critical steps for, um, for the unfair advantage method. So let's start with step one. Let's understand uh, your business's credibility in front of um, your customers. So here we use the credibility prism. You can do this yourself. You can use these four categories to review your own business. I would start with the team. Look at the team that the client is looking at and say, do these people have a reason that they're doing this? Do they have experience? Do they have functional and technical expertise? Because in the end, a B2B customer who's switching from an incumbent like IBM to your business is taking career risk. So they need to trust that this team is highly credible, not here today, gone tomorrow, has done it before, has functional and technical expertise. So the more that you can build your credibility around your team and your heritage, the better. Again, often overlooked. The second piece is the insights. So have you uh, are the insights you've got credible? Have you really done uh, the analysis into your target customer? Have you identified the problems that they've got that are unresolved? Have you worked out the, how your solution resolves it? And have you validated that with some primary research? If you've done the insights, then you should be getting traction. Is your traction um, credible? Have you identified the customers? Are you selling product? Have you got traction with sales and revenue? And can you see that it's repeat? Try to show your credibility on, on your traction. And then finally, it's your credibility as a business. As your business is going to grow, have you identified your stages of organizational growth and what is required um, for you to continue to hit the funding milestones with a sustainable, repeatable business? This credibility analysis is what venture capitalists do, perhaps without knowing, that's how they look at your businesses. But we use it as a framework to evaluate every business to see if you are A, ready to raise money and B, ready to go to market. So I'd really encourage you to think of this prism and evaluate yourselves objectively through that. Maybe ask your chairman or your board or your investor what their view is of your business is through this credibility prism. The second step then is to create and test evidence-driven personas and value propositions using a new insight. This is the bedrock of your marketing plan, which is the bedrock of your revenue, which is the bedrock of your ability to raise money and sustain your business. Foundationally, have you really, really understood the influencers who are going to um, influence the buying decision that you're selling? If you're in the B2C market, normally that is the social signaling um, of buying a product. So I buy this product because I think other people will respect me for it. That's very consumer-led branding. The majority of you guys will be in B2B. And if you're selling into small to medium enterprises, normally what influences their decision-making is productivity, money-saving, stress reduction, and something that's low risk. If you're selling B2B or B2C, the decision-makers have to balance their end users as well as their internal business needs. So you have two stakeholders to think about um, how you position. And then if you're selling to enterprises, like many of you will be, know that there are many influencers within an organization who will influence the decision-making of using or buying your product. And we call those the crocodiles and the lions. The lions and the crocodiles are the two characters inside a business who you're selling to. The lions are really obvious. They're the ones who are visible. They're probably quite alpha. They've probably got very clearly articulated targets. They may scratch you and bite you in the process, but they're very, very obvious to work with. The ones to watch out for are the crocodiles. The crocodiles are the ones who hide under the water. You can't see them, just their eyes peering through. But when you step into their territory and you threaten their territory, they snap and bite your leg off. And those are the ones that kill the sales deals. So really clear signals of issues like that is we've been talking to this really big customer. They're giving us all the right buy signals, but we're not making any progress. That normally means that the person you're talking to is a lion. But in the background, there's a crocodile who's stopping the deal and understanding who the crocodiles are, what is their fears, what are their motivators, and then creating propositions for them is critical to driving um, enterprise sales. 
So really look at your sales cycles and wonder and do an analysis of why they're taking longer than you think they should. Normally, it's because there's a crocodile in the background that you need to identify and create a value proposition for. And that's what stakeholder mapping is. So when, when you are looking at your segments and you've identified who you're selling to, you really need to identify who is the buyer buying patterns within the organization. Often you will be selling to a CIO, a CEO, a, a head of procurement, a head of information security, um, it may be even to uh, the data team. Whatever your product or service is, there's never one per purchaser. There are normally five or six, and you have to understand the segments you're selling to and then map who the buyers are behind the scenes. Once you map those buyers, you can identify the insights and the messages to communicate to each one of them in order to facilitate your sale. And again, you can measure yourself on reducing the sales cycle. The more you understand the stakeholders, the more calibrated your message is to all of the stakeholders resolving all of their problems, the faster your sales cycle will be, which means the faster your revenue growth will be. And you do that by mapping buying journeys. So this is an example from one of our customers, Get Transfer, which is the world's largest airport transfer um, mobility app. Here we are looking at how we are recruiting drivers. Um, and here we are mapping all the steps that a potential driver would go through in selecting a, uh, a mobility partner. We identify at each step, how emotionally are they feeling? What are their triggers? What are their barriers and, and emotions? And then how our messages can calibrate against that. So whatever your category is, you should be identifying the segments you want to sell to, the stakeholders inside those segments who influence the purchasing decision and then understand the insights emotionally and rationally about how they feel about the purchase so you can line up your product features against it. And ultimately, this is what the critical work looks like. It's a value proposition design template that identifies on the left, in this case, this is an insurance um, uh, business that we're selling into. On the left, you've worked out who you're selling to. You've identified what jobs he needs resolving, what his benefits he needs are and what his weaknesses are. In the middle, you're identifying against each of his pains how the, how the features of your product line up against them. So you're getting um, features of your products resolving problems that they've got. And then on the right, you've calibrated that into your value proposition statement, which is our product helps this person who's trying to achieve this, and we help them by offering X and Y instead of Z. That is the fundamental value proposition structure that you need for each of the people you're selling into. In order to populate that, you need insight. And the insight is the research methodology of doing qualitative research with people in each segment. And it doesn't really matter what stage of your business is. We do this for series D businesses. We do this for seed businesses. Fundamentally, this is how you de-risk your marketing, which is using primary insight into each segment you're selling. So you really understand the problems that you can resolve with your product so that you get ultimate message market fit. And that, and then once you have that, you validate it. So you start by uncovering the jobs and the pains and the gains. You then draft test messages. So based on the value propositions template we showed you, you then draft messaging. You then qualitatively test that messaging and then you quantitatively test that messaging. This flywheel should continue for the entirety life cycle of your business because you're continually optimizing insight, message, and uh, media. And that enables you to continually bring down um, your customer acquisition cost and show your investors that you're a highly optimized marketing machine. So if you think marketing, many people think marketing is tactical and fluffy, but the reality is it's an engineering process, just like developing your product. The third step is the fluffy bit. The third step is once you've identified who you're selling to, what the problems are, how your product can resolve those and what the value propositions are, and then you've stakeholder mapped, you then need to be noticeable. You need some element of fame and differentiation, some sort of heart con contact that enable persuades people to try you as a startup, bearing in mind you're relatively high risk compared to their existing service. And that's what having a disruptive point of view in a brand does. And we evidence shows that building a brand in B2B or B2C that has some element of emotional relevance is delivers profit over time. So this is the data from the seminal study, which is the long and the short of it by Bennett and Fields. They looked at a thousand different marketing um, use cases to identify what happens if you have a purely rational um, marketing program, i.e. my product does this, or you have an emotional campaign, i.e. our product will make you feel like this, or you have both rational and emotional and combined. And what you see here 
is the data shows that when you build emotion and relevance into your marketing, you will deliver more profit over time. So you can see the pure emotion in one to two years delivers 21% and profit uplift. And if you uh, deliver that over time, over three plus years, that goes up to 43%. So the point here is counterintuitively, you will think you just need to talk about how clever your product is, but actually having a brand that ties into an emotional need of your buyer and all, all B2B buyers are humans, they are all driven by emotion, then you will deliver loyalty and profit over time and you can justify price premium. So really, 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 if there's one slide that I'd love you to really walk away with is go, okay, if I want to be differentiated, what is the emotional relationship I've got um, with, my, with my customers? And that will deliver you more profit over time. And once you understand that, you develop your unique point of view. So there's a very simple structure here. If you want to find what work out what your brand differentiation is, you have to go, what is true about your product? What is it about your product that is um, va validated and truthful? Then what is true about how your customer interacts with your category? How are they currently engaging in the category? And then what are the trends that everyone is, is operating within? The confluence of those three things, the intersection of the truth about your product, your customer, and the trends in the category will be your unique point of view. And if you can elevate your point of view out of function and benefit and into a vision of where the category is going, you will get differentiation. You will get an unfair advantage in the media coverage, and you will be more credible and noticeable. And this is a really, really important part of your process. So once you've done the segmentations, the stakeholder mapping, and then you've done your brand differentiation, you can actually capture your strategy on one page. And there is a myth that when you hire brilliant people, you should um, let them come in and um, put their own stamp on everything. That is absolutely fine if you're a publicly listed company and you have a big uh, treasury that can justify a slower growth rate. But when you're a startup, you have to move extremely fast. And any month, that is um, lost or wasted due to internal discussions or inertia is incredibly expensive for the company and the investors and incredibly high risk. So actually what you need to do as founders is do the strategic work that we've just walked you through, evidence it, get it approved by your board, get it approved by your investors and lock it down. So you have a strategy on a page that is not up for debate so that when you hire brilliant people in, they understand that the strategy has been validated and approved and their job is to bring it to market. If everyone comes in and starts to reinvent your strategies, you will find yourself eight months down the line with a very, very slow growth rate and you will company will die. So capturing your strategy on a page for everyone to use is essential. This is the template um, that, that, that we suggest uh, you fill out, which is all part of the, um, the, the unfair advantages process and methodology. And here's an example of one we did for Calendly. So for Calendly, we said, what is the current situation if you're a self-employed or micro business manager? The current situation is scheduling meetings takes loads of time. The desired outcome is not to have to think about organizing my calendar. How I'm currently working around it is using emails or uh, an expensive PA or using uh, apps that don't talk to each other. What's getting in the way is I have multiple calendar accounts. I have too many emails. I'm stressed and my days are busy. And what's the impact of that? is that my meetings don't happen, time is wasted, and money is wasted. The solution I want as a small business owner is to be able to add and receive meetings in my calendar in seconds and not have to think about it. So what is the new thing that Calendly is bringing to the market? What is its di differentiation? It's got brutal simplicity of design and implementation. The reward for that is I don't have to think about meetings. And the transformation is I go from being confused and having wasted time to increased productivity which means that I get to a value proposition, which is that our simple marketing booking tool, Calendly, helps busy contractors, self-employed and micro business managers who want, to, who want their time booked by removing wasted time and back and forth hassle and increasing the productivity of their day, unlike the competitors un or unlike using my own diary or hiring someone to do it. So our productive point of view, provocative point of view is winners don't organize their own meetings. And the elevator pitch is that Calendly is the simplest way to book meetings and manage your calendar, saving our smart customers hours every month by removing hassle and headspace so they can be more productive and successful. This is an example of a strategy on a page for a target segment for a, for a functional product. And once you have done all the homework to get this locked down, this is what your marketing team need to go and execute ruthlessly to ensure that you get your progressive revenue targets hit. 
The final step is your actual go to market. How do you spend your investors' money in an efficient way to ensure you get profitable growth? And there are three ways of looking at this. If you're a seed stage business, what you're looking is for message market fit. You're trying to seek market validation for your core idea. And you do this, use your customers to test your hypothesis. If you're series A to B, you need to show scalable product market fit. What that means is your product is in the market, you've got repeatable customers, and you're continually expanding and testing segments and channels. If you're series B+, plus, you're looking for platform market fit. That means predictable revenue from multiple products, which is using both ABM and GTM systems. So you should look at this and, and plot yourself on where you are on that journey and whether you need message market fit, product market fit, or platform market fit. The foundations under all three of these is that you will always need your segmentation, your personas, validated value propositions, your brand differentiation, and your growth strategy, the four steps of the unfair advantage method. And once you have that, you go and build your machine, which means that you test your messaging through A-B testing in your media to continually op uh, optimize and, and refine it. So that's um, testing headlines, testing messages <laughs> to bring in leads and show your investors that you have a habit of using weekly data sets to optimize the spend of the investor's money to drive revenue. You want to be able to show minimum three months when you go and speak to investors of how, of how you are optimizing your media spend, doing A-B testing to get to the most efficient spend of their media, of their investment money. Don't forget that for investors, when they're investing at a, a stage of a company where, they, where they're trying to grow, it's like the highest risk moment because you're giving money to founding teams who are often brilliant product specialists and engineers, and they're now going to spend 50% of that um, raised money on a marketing discipline that often there isn't the IQ inside the company of having done it before. So for founder, for investors, it's a majorly high risk, which is why the unfair advantage model is all about de-risking the investment capital and de-risking the, um, the marketing growth. And then that gets you to your marketing plan and you'll have your own internal performance um, uh, team or revenue team, or you'll be using an agency. Either way, you will need to calibrate of your every dollar you spend on, on media and marketing, how much of it is sales focused and how much of it is emotion and brand building. The data shows, according to the IPA and according to the Burnett and Fields um, research report, that 46% of your budget should go on brand building, on building the emotion, and 54% on lead gen. Investors hate that. Boards hate that. Founders hate that because it makes them feel very uncomfortable. But the data shows that if you do that split, you will get more profitable um, uh, growth over time. It's quite hard to get that across the board, but you should have that as a general framework um, as you work out your media allocations. So those are the four steps. Step one, review your business through the credibility prism. How credible are you from um, insight, uh, team, product, and revenue sustainability? Step two is how much do you really understand who you're selling to? Have you got the segmentation? Have you got the personas? Have you done qualitative research to identify the insights? And then have you developed value propositions to resolve each, in each insight per buyer per segment? Step three is then position your brand. Find that intersection between what's true about your product, what's true about the cat how your customer shops in the category, and what's true about the trends in the, in the industry at that moment. At the intersection of those three will be your unique point of view. And then stop, step four is ruthlessly um, execute and optimize by using A-B testing across your paid media and build in as much emotional marketing as you can in order to differentiate and build a more profitable customer base. Those are the four steps uh, for the unfair advantage model. And the result of that for an investor is if you've gone through these four steps and you've used data along the way, is that they will see you as a de-risked investment because you've taken marketing, the highest risk part of the business, and you've uh, researched it, you've optimized it, you've evidenced it, and you've really distilled what messages you're, you're presenting to what customers to drive what revenue. And that will enable your fundraising to be more efficient and your business to be more sustainable. So in, in some, the critical weapons to secure your, your unfair advantage, please walk away with these thoughts. The first one is marketing is critical to reaching your fundraising milestones. Work backwards from your next fundraising milestone and, under, and try to understand what the investors are looking for, for KPIs for you to hit. 
And remember that 50% of those will be customer and market related. Be customer obsessed. Validate, validate, validate your insights and assumptions. The most lethal thing here is to rely on your own assumptions and you have to go to primary evidence. That's what you need to show to your, to your board that, um, that you've de-risked the approach and to your investors. Be really methodical. Discover, research, validate, differentiate, validate again, and then go to market and optimize. Continue that flywheel that you would use for your product development and apply it to your marketing. It's engineering mentality applied to both elements. Look for your emotional differentiation because your competitors won't. And that's your chance for you to stand out and, and, and acquire new customers. And then follow the method, use the tools and execute ruthlessly. So with that, we'll, we'll pause our, our, our offer. It's a, it's a special offer because Victoria is an incredible person that we are happy to offer any XTC startup um, to have a free review of your sales pitch or your fundraising pitch deck. So um, you'll see here, uh, amazingly, it's my email. I was really hoping it would be another email, but send them to this email. Send us your sales decks or your pitch decks, and we will run it through our evaluation method, and we will feed back to you um, on the areas where we think there's vulnerability so that you can work on your on your positioning and growth. And um, and then, of course, uh, if you don't fancy inundating my email, here is Noah, who is very much looking forward to receiving all of your pitch decks. So with that, I will uh, I will pause and open myself up for questions to uh, the group, if there are any. I wanna thank Fergus for that awesome presentation. I think you're always on point. Uh, you're strategic and yet you're practical. So offering uh, advice that the founders can implement immediately. So I appreciate that. My pleasure, Victoria. So uh, are there any questions from Mateus, Milind, Akshat, Reina, Gadi? I, I, I do have one to kick off. And oh, oh sorry, Gadi has a question. Are you going to unmute or? Let me let me kick us off. So um, press coverage is really, really important these days to build your visibility for your company, as you mentioned, as well as your personal brand. How do you get on? And you've been featured, you know, all the time on Bloomberg and how do you get on those shows? So uh, you have to have a point of view. Mm -hmm. So um, in the end, uh, it's two things. Number one, you know, we spoke about brand differentiation where you have to say what's true about my product, what's true about my customers and what's true about the trends in my category. In the middle of that is a provocative point of view. Mm -hmm. And you really need to work out what that is. And it's got to be elevated beyond your products. Mm -hmm. Once you have that provocative point of view, that's what the PR agencies will pitch to the media. Mm. So um, I'll give you an example. You know, back in the day at WPP, the provocative point of view we wrote for IBM was that the world would be a better place if we, if we were a smarter interconnected planet. Mm -hmm. So IBM's provocative point of view was to be the smarter in interconnected planet. And then they, could, then they can talk about all of the products that enable the planet mm -hmm. to be smarter and interconnected. And so, and this is more important <coughs> more important to startups than anyone else because fundamentally you no one knows you guys you mm -hmm. know you haven't had the benefit of 10 years worth of marketing to build your credibility in your brand so you the unfair advantage is to have a view on the future and where it's going and uh you know i, I will give you and, and this is a great opportunity actually because often you will be competing against businesses who've been around for a while mm -hmm. they are normally not innovative so you can come in and talk about how you see the market is moving, what you see the future is. And if you have a view of what the future looks like, it means you have a very important um, voice today. So really understand what your provocative point of view is and then brief the PR agency to, um, to spend, about, it takes about six months to get profile on really major titles because they need to pitch you in. The second thing you will need is some sort of data set. So uh, the, the classic thing would be that you have run a research report with, um, uh, with a specialist partner to provide insight into your category. So if we just use something that's top of mind for me right now, if you're in the alternate protein space um, in food technology, the restriction for mass adoption is that the products are too expensive. The, uh, the thing that will change that will be manufacturing at scale. So if you are an alternate um, protein um, food tech startup, you should be talking about how do we get to manufacturing at scale to get to price parity to drive mass consumption. And then you would run a research report with 
a local university or, or research specialist that gives insight into the future of manufacturing. That, that, and that gives you substance and a point of view that the media will pick up. Right. Super relevant. Thank you. So uh, this is something that you need to hire a PR firm to help you get there, or is this something that a startup can figure out themselves? No, I mean, in the end, um, there are billions of businesses trying mm -hmm. to get coverage. You need to uh, find a PR agency. And I would say that's also quite challenging. But if people need some recommendations, we've worked with a few that we think are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And they all have the media relationships. So they've spent 10 years building relationships with TechCrunch, Bloomberg, Forbes, Business Week, the Financial Times, and you are paying for their relationships. And what you need to do is excite the PR people, then agree a commercial deal with them, which will feel like sunk money because it won't drive leads. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, if you can get on significantly respected media as a startup, it means you're building your credibility and you're de-risking yourselves as a business to your customers. So you need a PR agency or a PR agent, for sure. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Milind? Yeah. So at did what stage? Right? Did, did I Sorry, say yeah, that? you said it right. You said okay. it right, Fergus. So question is, uh, at what stage of uh, the growth journey yeah, would you feel that? Hello? Uh, Junaidu, would you mind going on mute, please? Okay. Uh, at what stage in the growth journey would you feel it's appropriate to start considering uh, investing in a PR agency? Very early or, you know, after stage A, B, or whatever? Well, I think you need to have product market fit first. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have evidence that your product is um, solving a problem that customers care about and are willing to pay for. Because the only right. point of engaging a PR agency is when you're ready to go to market beyond your network. You will have a network of customers who you've worked with and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. that is a very false positive. Because, you know, your network will know Milind. They've worked with Milind. He's a really bright guy and he's very, very trustworthy. So they will give you business. But that isn't a proxy for the growth of your company. So once you've used your network to get product market fit, and then you decide that you're ready to invest money in paid media to drive leads, that's right. when you engage a PR agency. Because ultimately, um, Milind, what you want is to walk into the room and your customer who doesn't know you, right? To have done a Google search and have seen that you've come up on the finance, on the Wall Street Journal or, the, or TechCrunch, so you are visible, so that you look credible. And then to have seen on LinkedIn, I'm assuming you're a B2B business, but it, you know we can adapt whatever. But on LinkedIn, yeah. to have seen an advert promoting your product resolves a problem that is relevant to me. Can you just quickly tell me what your business is, Milin? Uh, we are in the field of uh, uh, advanced manufacturing, predictive maintenance. So okay. we, we uh, you know, make sure that uh, from a remote location, we can identify what's uh, wrong with uh, your machines and make sure that uh, we give you advanced notifications so they don't fail. Great. You so I correct can, action I, time. So I can see there that um, you, you're probably selling to like two or three different people, like engineers and finance managers and, in, and risk or insurance people. So I, if I'm one of those three segments, I'm going to want to have seen you in visible media saying you've got a you've got a view on right di digitally remote management of hardware is uh the the way to create value over time right something like that yeah yeah and then and then I want to then see a linkedin ad that says hey cfo uh we can reduce your risk exposure by 15% um because we can predict your machinery before it goes bust so you're getting right. me from the top and the bottom yeah that would make sense. And, and then how do you look at, uh, you know, so this is what I would call paid media. I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, advertising, you know, getting uh, a PR agency to formally, uh, you know, help you get the uh, visibility. 
as also you know increasingly uh, you're seeing things like linkedin your uh, and social media which are what you would call uh, you know not paid but just you know trying to use word of mouth as well as uh, uh, awareness so how would you uh, classify uh, i mean how would you differentiate between the two uh, whether it's effectiveness or should we do both or yeah, focus yeah. on one versus the other the, it, it's a compounding multiplier effect mm -hmm. so uh, again there's data from the Bennett and Phil study which I really recommend everyone reads um which shows you, you send that. us a link or something so that uh, yeah, no will you just that? put a link to the Bennett and Field study in the in, in the chat please um, okay yeah but sure. uh but yeah so um it's a multiplier effect so so effectively what what it will what it will do is if you have earned media, which is PR, and yeah. you have um, owned media, which is your own LinkedIn channels, your own website, your own blog, your own content marketing, and then right. paid media, which is buying reach by buying media space to put your stuff on. If you yeah. multiply those three things, you will get a better co customer acquisition, lower cast customer acquisition costs because you're surrounding your customer with messages. So you need to have them all working together. Otherwise, it becomes individually too expensive. But that's what your media, either your internal marketing team would put together. By the way, I mean, that's what the unfair advantage method gets you to. It gets you to a go-to-market plan that says this message in this media, in this format, to this customer to drive this result. And once you have that framework, you then get your either internal media guys to execute or you get an external media agency to execute against that plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. No problem. Any, uh, any other questions? Going once, going twice, going thrice. Okay. I have one. I'm going to follow up with uh, Millard's question. So for startups like with limited capital, how would you maximize your marketing campaign? I know you touch a little bit about, about that. Yeah, um, I mean, everyone, no one has got enough marketing budget. Absolutely no one. Um, everyone is, <laughs> is short on marketing budget. So um, so I think uh, to be to maximize it, you have to invest in doing the homework. So uh, the wrong thing to do, which is what most people do, is they just start buying digital media. They start saying, okay, we'll spend $5,000 a month. But but it's like shooting from the hip, blind, with an arm tied behind your back, uphill with the wind against you. Like you can't, you have no idea if you're, if you're gonna get to the right customers. So I would really suggest if you have limited resources, assume everyone has that. Doing the validation work we described, so really doing the homework on who you're selling to and what the insight is and doing some research. I mean, you're talking researching 10 people in each segment, 30 people max. It's so important because it means that if you've got a dollar, to, if, if you've only got $10 to spend, you are de-risking the failure of that. So, so to answer your question, Nancy, no one's got enough money to maximize it, do the homework. Most likely your competitors won't which is your unfair advantage. Any other, any other questions? Okay, great. Well, Team XTC, thank you for an ecstasy session. It was brilliant. Um, always a pleasure to help the community and please do take up the offer. Um, we'll obviously put it in the link on the recording uh, to send us your sales deck or your investment deck, we will run it through our evaluation method and identify where we think the vulnerabilities are and what you what you can do about it. We're really happy to make that offer. So please, uh, please inundate us with your with your um, materials. Yeah, I will. And make uh, obviously you are recommending these are two totally different uh, uh, decks. Yeah, right? I mean we we would love both, but yeah. we'll take okay. either. You know, sometimes people don't have the sales deck. Because the hand, often what we see, um, uh, Milind, is the founders are doing what we call hand-to-hand -hand combat, where like the founder is doing all the sales. Yeah. And yeah. really, and because the founder knows everything, they don't really need a deck, a sales deck. They just talk. Um, and so that's why we ask for the investment deck if they don't have the sales deck. But we'll take both.
Okay. Now we've got both. We got uh, you know we spend a lot of time creating two separate ones because the audience is very different. But Absolutely. obviously, there's there's uh, always a ton of stuff you can do to make yourself more effective. Brilliant. Well, looking so forward we to taking you up on your offer. Awesome. Okay, guys. Uh, thanks very much. Anything, uh, Victoria? Anything else to add, or are we done? Uh, no, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the founders um, that are uh, joining us today and everybody who's watching. And we look forward to seeing you next. So stay in touch with us and stay in touch with Fergus via LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks guys. And thank Chelsea. you so much, Fergus. Wonderful. Okay. See you guys. Talk See you, Alex. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.